Uh, my name is Tammy Burke. I'm in the English department at Otterbein uh, in Westerville. I'm also the director of the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program there. Um, but those are not the things that, that I think brought on the invitation. I've been teaching graphic narrative at Otterbein for the last eight years, and uh, Jared Gardner, who teaches it at OSU, has helped me a lot. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to be able to get a chance to um, come out and talk about an amazing book um, that I, honestly that I was only able to, to find because I was invited to do this series. Um, it was a. Uh, <laughs> what happened? You came. Oh. <laughs> Just make sure, really make sure it has me. <laughs> okay. So it was the German poet uh, Rainer Maria Rilke who reminded us that, and I'm quoting what's, what you see up here on the screen, that things are not nearly so comprehensible and sayable as we are generally made to believe. Most experiences, he insisted, are unsayable, which is a word I love. They come to fullness in a realm that words do not inhabit. I'm really happy to join you today and share some of my thoughts about Paul's graphic novel, Mother Come Home, a text that I believe is very much about the human and the occasionally cosmic wrestle with that which is unsayable. This is the book itself, and I'm happy to sort of, you know, pass this around, distribute it. Okay. Hmm? Yeah, I know, but so people can, so people can look at it, too. Um, we all know that there are thoughts, feelings, and sensations that appear to live beyond the limits of language and understanding. There is, for many of us, a moment of recognition um, that language allows you to only go so far and to say so much. There is, for many of us, a moment in which we strain to find words that are adequate to our subject. And while it's true that sometimes we can't find the language that we need to say the things that we must, you know what, we also know that when language is available sometimes for a variety of reasons, we nonetheless choose to remain silent. Sometimes we choose against the revelation of a significant personal truth or sorrow, as is the case in this text. Sometimes we protect our secrets or the secrets of another long after they've outlived their usefulness. Sometimes we withhold a confession that might actually bring clarity and comfort to ourselves and others. Whatever the case, I think that all of us here know what it is like to come up against the boundaries of what Rilke calls the unsayable. And Mother Come Home is a graphic narrative that superbly illustrates, both literally and figuratively, what it is to lose language, what it is to lose understanding, what it is to lose meaning itself after the world has handed you a grief that cannot be adequately represented in word or image. Okay. What you see here is the cover of the text that's now getting distributed. Um, there's a very interesting door knocker, you know, obviously here that's centered um, in the, on the page. It, it's designed to evoke a mask that I'll talk about a little bit later, and it, and it serves as a pretty obvious invitation for the reader to come inside. Okay. The frontispiece, okay, so this is the, you know, the title page. Um, you'll see, like many of the pages that, that follow it, um, is surrounded by uh, scrawlings, uh, notations, equations, um, written by the protagonist father, who is a professor of symbolic logic. So from the very beginning, the book is sort of framed as a conversation that is sort of a, uh, in a kind of open tension, really, um, with logic itself. Published by Dark Horse Books in 2003, Mother Come Home is the story of a father and a young son's attempt to survive the death of the mother. The mother is a haunting and a partial presence. She is named belatedly and reluctantly, and she's only physically present in two early frames of the text. This is one of them. Uh, in these frames were afforded only the glimpse of a fingernail that you don't see here, um, and also a left arm, okay, in the far left frame, offering a lion's mask to her son for play. Our narrator, the young boy Thomas that you see here, tells us that his mother liked to give presents. She was, it seems, a generous and exuberant soul. She created gardens of great beauty and brilliance, and she acted as, and I quote, the spontaneous counterpart to the rational logics of the father. And of course, the mother, while she was alive, she came to stand for something greater than herself. She represented and provided access to a way of thinking and feeling that affirmed both the goodness and the grace of life. Mother, as is so often the case in the popular imagination, is a figure who dispels darkness and allies with all that's easy and all that's redemptive. So the loss of the mother in Mother Come Home is a loss of monumental proportion. For the family not only loses an essential member of this unit that's already, 
quite small, already only numbers three, right? They also lose the possibility for a way of being that's only made possible when mother is present. The grief and the confusion and the disorientation that follows the death of the one that cannot be lost shapes every frame and mother come home. In this way, it is very much a book that meditates on who and what we become after loss. One thing that I find very interesting visually about this text is that Paul designs and draws this story with a, with a very clean line, a clean and precise, not unsteady line. Although the months that follow the mother's death, like the months that follow any great loss, are enormously disordered and erratic. The clean line, coupled with the muted and the elegiac colors in Paul's palette, lend the story a kind of spareness that's both literal and existential. There is very little detail in the interior spaces or landscape. The home, is bare, the home itself is barren after the mother's death. It's stripped of specificity and personality. Here you see the parents' bedroom um, vacated, actually, after the, the death of the mother. Similarly, and all the rooms in the house look uh, quite similar to this. Similarly, the landscape itself is desolate and absent of vegetation. Here you see a dual splash page of father and son at the newly dug grave of the mother. They are offset in a barren corner of the cemetery. Okay? Um, and they are swallowed by, I mean, I wish that this could do it justice. They're swallowed by this very rich and evocative russet brown sky um, that you see quite often in the text. I love this color that's often used to depict the sky early, um, early on. It's not a traditionally bleak shade of gray, which is, I think, what you would come to expect, especially in winter. Um, it's muted, but when you open up to it, there's, a, there's this surprising and slight sort of warmth to it. We understand that these two, I mean within the first few pages, we understand that these two, father and son, they're abandoned. But the two, the young boy narrator who's no more than 10, and his father who spends the first third of the text in a near constant physical slump, these two respond very differently to the abandonment. We understand, thanks to a preface that reads like an increasingly dark dream, that the father experienced the death of his wife as a traumatic event, an event that destroyed his capacity for both language and meaning. This is, this is a page that's pulled from the preface, and you, I think you get, it's drawn uh, quite differently, um, and obviously it's not designed to be representational. Um, but you see, um, this is about you know, eight to nine pages of an airborne version of the father relentlessly searching for his lost wife. The death itself understood as T, okay, both I think standing in for time itself, you know, as you would expect, but also I would suggest the moment of traumatic impact. Okay. T has rendered the world illegible. The father tells us, and I'm quoting, that he has figured out things generally, but he's still not sure what's happened. End quote. I think that this is an amazing way to describe this indescribable thing. This thing that you know, but you can't believe. This thing that one can only figure out generally. In the same way that we generally know that people die, but we nonetheless feel stunned and occasionally ambushed when it actually happens. Interestingly, a traumatic event, by definition, is an experience that cannot be assimilated, that will not submit itself to language, that refuses, absolutely refuses to be symbolized. If it were symbolized, it would have the capacity to be made legible, to be made clear, both to the one who experienced it and to others. Trauma, by definition, is opaque. It is impenetrable. We are, as Thomas's father puts it, quote, not sure what happened, although it's clear that something profound and catastrophic has. Even more, to be traumatized, Kathy Carruth tells us, is to be, quote, possessed by an image or an event. Possessed, I think, is a really interesting word here, as it suggests that that traumatic event, that capital T, has come to own your psychic space, and it's locked you in an obsessive relation to it. Your, your psyche, in short, comes to a full stall. And following the traumatic event, it's important to remember that the past is never fully retired. You just keep recirculating what you can't understand what you're incapable of processing. You never get to leave the scene of the traumatic, no matter how much time or distance you gain on it. 
The preface to Mother Come Home, those initial eight pages, make this very plain to the reader. It is all recursivity. It is all circling. It is all a closed loop. The father tells the same stories over and over again. He asks the same questions, infinite variations on one. Where are you? And he circles T, capital T, the moment in time when catastrophe came and robbed him of the ability to make sense, however you understand it, again. The father and mother come home, collapses in on himself after his wife's death. He retreats into isolation. He loses his ability to function in any facet of his life. He begins to speak less and less, perhaps because he distrusts the ability of language to represent his truth. He lives, we are told by our narrator most wonderfully, quote, in a sealed space beneath mother. And we know where mother is. In trauma, Carruth tells us, quote, the greatest confrontation with reality may occur as an absolute numbing to it, end quote. Both dazed and anesthetized, Thomas's father leaves life. He buries himself with his own hands. Thomas, his son and our narrator, makes a valiant effort to manage his grief and blunts the impact of his mother's abandonment, especially for his father. Thomas most creatively declares himself a groundskeeper. This is his word, and this is his costume. Over here, you can see in the frame in the upper left-hand corner. Okay? It is a lion's, that lion's mask that was um, delivered to him by his mother. I mean, that's the most important prop in the costume. Thomas most creatively declares himself a groundskeeper, a custodian of both order and predictability. He tends all the spaces that his mother loved and lived in while she was alive, her garden, her bedroom, her gravesite, what he calls, I think, most provocatively, um, the hiding place, and the woods also where he was conceived. And Thomas works to provide what he calls, this is his word, a thin veil of normalcy, islands of order in a world that's emptied of both reason and rightness. He dons his lion's mask and he goes about his work. He goes about his work fantastically creating a world where mothers don't die and fathers are protected from self-destruction. This task is a profound one for a child, just as it would be a profound one for an adult. I love this page in particular because you can see, I don't know if you can read the, um, the text on here, um, but um, he's, a, he's sort of confessing here and it's become obvious that there's, there's no longer any singing, there's no longer any merriment, uh, any joy in our life, um, you know, without mother. But nonetheless, that spring, the spring following her death, everything, he says, tried so hard. Everything tried so hard that spring. Okay? There was not a lack of effort. We cannot be blamed for that. Okay? And I love the way that, I mean, I love the way that there is something on this page really compulsory and performative um, about this whole exercise in getting back to normal, okay? Or at least like simulating normal. And I think that, at least I did, that we recognize ourselves in a layout like this. We recognize the human impulse to sort of simulate a life that has, in fact, been destroyed. But we know that this exercise, you know, however I think, like, brave it is, we know that it will only distract father and son from the truth for a short time. It's a stopgap, it's not a solution, it's a loving illusion, but it's not going to be able to withstand all that continues to collapse around it, and collapse it does. Thomas accidentally tips his uncle to the fact that his father, who is, as I told you, a professor of symbolic logic, has not been attending and showing up for his lectures. This new knowledge, combined with the increasing, um, and frankly, the frightening, uh, depression and decline of Thomas's father convinces the family that he needs to be hospitalized. So we watch Thomas's father in the middle section of this text, in session at a psychiatric hospital. He's entirely flattened in affect, and he's in full-on existential despair. Thomas's father tells the supervising psychiatrist that, quote, it's a great line, he recognizes the fact of his wife's death. He has no trouble with that but not the absurdity to which it leads." End quote. We discover that this man is struggling not only with the fact of his grief, that's just part of it, but also the sudden evacuation of meaning in his world. In this way, Thomas's father is something other than a man just in mourning. Okay? He is also now a melancholic, as Sigmund Freud might understand it. Whereas a human being in mourning ideally 
like comes to objectively realize right the loss of the loved one and respond to what Freud calls uh, the call to reality, the call to return to reality. Right? The melancholic mourns without end. The melancholic remains devoted to grief itself. And the melancholic refuses to resolve the past in order to open up the possibility for a future that isn't already overwritten by loss. The melancholic, Freud tells us, is often unsure, truly unsure, about the source of his or her grief. Unlike the mourner, the melancholic has lost something foundational, something essential to being, something impossible to name, and therefore something impossible to adequately grieve. In Mother Come Home, the psychiatrist recognizes this. He recognizes this melancholic, I think, turn in Thomas's father. He urges him, for example, in this really cool line, to quote, decide what you're saying goodbye to, as if to acknowledge that his wife's death was just a catalyst, was likely just a catalyst for other less tangible losses. But at the same time, the psychiatrist is busy encouraging Thomas's father to seek, as quickly as he can, a decisive, quote, anchor in reality, like some island of order on which he might spend his days with less desire to, quote, grab hold of that lost thing. In the hope that he can move him in the direction of a more manageable mourning, which is just to say a loss that a person can survive, the psychiatrist asks Thomas' father, pleads with him actually, to recommit to reality and a new set of facts that they both know are incontrovertible. She's dead. You're here. Your son needs you. This may all be true in some literal sense, but Thomas's father, and this is the thing the psychiatrist is incapable of understanding, but I imagine that Paul hopes the reader can. Thomas's father has lost the capacity to trust that facts lead to anything but further absurdity. Symbolization, whether it's in language or it's in logic, only works to create what Thomas's father now calls little systems of explanation that fend off the unthinkable thing, that meaning isn't stable, it's not reliable, that absurdity runs the numbers, and that life has the capacity to ridicule and reduce our logics to nonsense. The two frames that I want to just show you here very quickly reinforce this, what, I, what feels very much like a standoff between the psychiatrist and Thomas's father in the hospital. Um, and this you see, and this, this happens repeatedly, <coughs> The two occupy opposite and actually opposing frames. Okay. And in this, um, and this is actually a whole tier, so, so a whole line, sort of you know, in the graphic uh, text. Um, you, you see here the psychiatrist um, in this oversized frame. The frame itself is oversized. It sort of leeches onto the other. Um, he, he's, his face, his, he is exaggerated and enlarged. And, and you see Thomas here, again, as he's trying to like grapple with the the facts that he's been told he must. Thomas's father is shrunken and diminished in the frame alongside. While his father is hospitalized, Thomas hatches a plan to save him, and he walks himself to the hospital with the intent on breaking him out. The rescue fantasy of the son is really nicely symmetrical with the rescue fantasy of the father, as they both seek to save the lost thing, and they both seek to restore the wholeness of meaning as a result. However, while walking, Thomas begins to question the viability of a rescue that arrives too late. Not the fact of a rescue itself, or the impulse to rescue, but what it means to um, maybe rescue at the wrong time. He recognizes that he may be no more capable of saving a dead mother than a damaged father. He contemplates the possibility that his father, hollowed out and fading, may, like his mother, be also beyond salvation. At the same time, however, this doesn't discourage Thomas from his mission. If anything, it reinforces his urgency. For Thomas, rescue is all about timing, getting there before the disaster is complete and therefore irreversible. Once he reaches the hospital, Thomas's father allows his son to believe that he's actually saved him, that he's become this agent of deliverance. He's arrived at the right time. And all of this despite the fact that we know, we as readers know, that Thomas's father had, at any given moment in the text, been able to voluntarily sign himself out. This is something that he doesn't explain or share with his, his son. After the father and son are on the run together in the final section of this book, it's not long before the father confesses, and I think it's a bit startling for the reader. 
that he believes that he himself is responsible for his wife's death. This, we learn, is because he assisted her in killing herself when she was too weak and frightened to complete it. For this reason, he feels implicated in both her death and the obliteration of meaning that followed it. Thomas's father tells his son that, quote, he has irretrievably destroyed everything. And he's also come to recognize, he's come to conclude, really, that, quote, in the vacuum, everything's nonsense is amplified unbearably. Worse, we understand that there's no way to unsee, that there's no way to unknow, there's no way to benignly bring down the volume after you've heard what's actually there. I can't read Thomas's father as a man who's been undermedicated or received too little psychotherapy. Right? I think that that would be um, an enormously oversimple reading of this book. He's a human being who's in crisis. He's someone who confronts a form of despair that all of us can recognize as possible, providing that we're dealt a blow that exceeds our capacity to absorb it. The text ends with a scene that is at once crushing and inescapable. Thomas's father decides to jump from a high cliff and kill himself. And he does so with the hand of his son, Thomas, on his frayed corduroy jacket. That's what you see here. The proximity of son to father immediately convinces Thomas that he, like his father, was responsible for the death of the one who could not be lost. What we see in the frames, however, is something else, something more complex and heartbreaking. Thomas touches his father. He lovingly touches his father. He, quote, condones his surrender in the same way that Thomas's father condoned the surrender of his wife. It is true that Thomas wishes that he, quote, could have been enough to bring him meaning, but that may be an impossibly romantic request. It is meaning itself that's taken a body blow. And Thomas's father disbelieves in the possibility for meaning of any sort in a world that now reveals itself as nonsensical. There's one last thing that I want to say about this, this book. It announces itself from the beginning as an introduction. And in fact, the three sections proceed as if they were a prelude to a concluding and unwritten chapter one. And chapter one is titled, We Are All Released. This is a really interesting, I've not seen this before, this is a really interesting narrative structure as it suggests that this whole story is a long and kind of la a languid wind-up for what follows. Our narrator is a retrospective one. It's an older Thomas who tells us the story of the loss of his parents in succession. And we're asked to see it actually as introductory material, as the groundwork for what is to follow, probably in adult life that sustains a complex relationship to grief and despair. But the final image is nonetheless a really intriguing one. And this is the final frame of the text. We are left with a young Thomas, whom you can see, you know, so, you know small here in the center, um, against a, a, it's not quite as brilliant in this rendition, but against a brilliant blue sky. And the sky only becomes blue or increasingly blue um, toward the end of the text. And the birds have taken away um, quite happily and greedily the remains of his father's uneaten sandwich. This just followed. His, his father's um, plunge. There's actually here in this last frame both visual and verbal release. There is some end to the live catastrophe for our narrator, although we are <coughs> unsure, of course, what chapter one holds. I mentioned when I began that I see this text as a meditation on who and what we become after great loss, but I also think it's a brave attempt to say something of the unsayable. And I greatly admire, I genuinely admire this book in its effort to find some way to represent in both word and image the desperate desire for both mother and meaning to come home. There are no words for this want. There are no words to cure it. There are no words capable of restoring what has been lost. But mother come home tries very hard. There is, as he himself notes, certainly no lack of effort to offer the reader a picture of who and what we are when both language and understanding have fled.